I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the Writers Guild Festival. Uh, this is the panel for the craft of writing and directing your own project. I'm here with two very talented writer directors, uh, Justin Chan, writer director and star of Blue Bayou. Welcome. Hi. And uh, writer director of the wonderful film Coda, Sean Hader. Hi. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to chat today. Um, First up, since you know not everybody uh, has necessarily had a chance to to see your films, I just want to uh, let our viewers have a little bit of an idea of um, what your movies are about. So, Sean, can you tell us a little bit about Coda? Um, sure. Oh my God, it's been so long since I pitched the movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Coda is the story of um, a uh, hearing teenager growing up in a deaf family where her parents and brother are deaf and they are Gloucester fishermen and struggling with their fishing business and she discovers a love of music and sort of has to make a choice between you know going out in the world and pursuing her own dream and the responsibilities that she feels to her family and so it's it's a coming of age about kind of having to individuate from the people that you love. And uh, Justin, what, uh, how would you describe Blue Bayou? Um, Blue Bayou is about a uh, Korean American <laughs> adoptee, um, Antonio LeBlanc. And um, he is uh, a Korean American guy that's, that's, that's uh, living in New Orleans and he um, gets an altercation with his uh, stepkid's dad, who's a cop. And um, it triggers um, it triggers a deportation uh, hearing, which he had no idea he was undocumented, especially being um, adopted. But uh, I guess that's the that's the gist of it. Um, you know, I think when when you're talking about uh, writer directors and we're talking about independent films like these, you know, um, they're not huge studio things. The the term personal project gets thrown around or thrown around a lot. Justin, I'm curious, what is that, you know, if someone were to describe Blue Bayou as a personal project for you, what would that, what does that mean? Um, it's, it's incredibly personal, you know, um, you know, the idea of international adoption uh, originated in Korea after the Korean War in the 50s. Um, there were a lot of like uh, orphans and kid on, kids on the street and this family called the Holt Couple came to Korea and, and um, try to place these kids in nice Christian homes in the United States. But, you know, over time, you know, adoption, international adoption has become a very, you know, um, international thing <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, much uh, a big business. But, um, you know, so naturally the, the, the numbers of Korean American adoptees are very high because it started there. Um, and, so growing up being Korean American, I just, it was just a part of very, my life, knowing a lot of adoptees. Um, so that's why it's personal. And then I, you know, hearing through the community and friends that, that uh, people were being deported was absolutely shocking. I just never understood how you could be brought overseas by, you know, an American couple and the U.S. Mm -hmm. government acknowledges these adoptions legally and, um, and then 20, 30 years later, you just, you, you realize that you're not an American and the, the country that brought you here tries to deport you. Um, it's pretty personal, you know? Yeah, I, I, I can imagine. Sean, what about you? What was your personal connection to CODA? What was your personal way into the story? I mean, it was an interesting combination because I think anything that I'm writing or taking on as a filmmaker becomes really personal because I sort of have to imbue a lot of myself and my own experience into it. And yet, you know, I was writing about a culture that was not my own um, and stepping in as kind of an outsider to deaf culture and doing a ton of research, you know, in the community and, and with collaborators to try to get the culture right. And at the same time, there were so many elements of the story that became intensely personal to me. I mean, I grew up in Boston in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and it was, you know, 50 minutes away from Gloucester. So I grew up, you know, going there every year of my life. And, and I knew that fishing community really well. And I'd seen kind of 
the heartbreak of a town that was completely built on this industry. And then the industry collapsed and people were losing their livelihood. And it was something that was a generational profession that was passed on, you know, from father to son. And this was like the generation that wasn't going out to sea. And so watching kind of this working class town die because of this. And so that was like a very, you know, interesting tension, I think, and conflict to put at the center of a story. And then just really connecting to um, the character of Ruby. I mean, I think I was a teenage girl and I, I understood what those tensions and those familial tensions can be. And I had immigrant parents and felt like they didn't understand who I was as an American kid. And so there was sort of my family was not deaf and yet I kind of understood what that felt like to have a bit of a cultural divide where you felt like, you know, they don't get who I am. And yet, you know, I need to go out in the world and be myself, but yet my own identity was very wrapped up in who my, you know, my parents were. And my dad was a refugee. And I think he had this feeling that we should all be like together at all times. You know, we, we were just like, if it were up to him, we would have been like sleeping in one bedroom and never leaving the room and like doing every single thing together. And so I think, you know, I had, I grew up with definitely that mentality of like, your family is everything and your family comes first and, and, you know, had to kind of start to realize that when I needed to create boundaries and go like, no, this is actually my thing. And this is how I'm separate. Um, so I think it just, you know, it starts to like become through the writing process. It just became more and more personal to me. And then my investment, I think in, in the portrayal of the deaf characters, because as I started to explore what films were out there that had portrayed, you know, not even one deaf character, let alone a family, you know, with multiple deaf characters. And there was like nothing to look at. I mean, there was no material, there was no movies out there. There were like a handful of, you know, four movies. And I was going back to children of a lesser God to look at a deaf character on screen, which was 35 years ago. And so then I had a huge investment personally, I think, as I felt like, you know, I was taking on this story about a community that is like almost never represented. And then when the community is represented, characters are often misrepresented and it's like, you know, either noble where it's, you know, a disabled person who is doing something that nobody could ever do, or it's something, an object of pity, or like, they're just all these horrible tropes that I think have existed for a long time. And so it was like, how do I create, you know, a real family and compelling three-dimensional characters that are going to just get you invested in this family, that one element of them is that they're deaf, but it's not sort of the defining feature of this family or these characters. You see, so you, you mentioned representation, which is something that I wanted to talk a little bit more about. Um, you know, as you said, you're you're making a film about a culture that you know you yourself are not a part of. And I'm curious, you know, if you could talk a little bit more about the responsibility that you sort of feel when you're when you're um, when you're making a film about people and about a subject or subject matter that isn't really widely seen. So you know, you said you had to go all the way back to Children of a Lesser God. Well, now people are going to go Children of a Lesser God and Coda. Right. So what, is that, what, what does that mean to you? I mean, you know, it's hard because it's one movie, right? So you can't like fix the problem with one movie. And in a way, like also you just have to tell that specific story and you can't try to make up for all of the flaws of representation with one film. And I also just really felt like I was a hearing person and I was always going to have a hearing lens on the film. And so I had to make sure that I had like a true team around me creatively that where I had deaf eyes on the script and on set and every step of the way and multiple people. So it didn't feel like you're bringing in a consultant to then sign off and go, no, check, you did it right. Like I needed sort of people every step of the way and multiple voices as a part of the process. Um, and still I kind of came up against my hearing perspective all the time. I mean, I felt like there were scenes, you know, where I kind of would go, oh, right. I mean, I remember setting up the living room furniture of the house with my production designer and, you know, Ann Tomasetti, who was one of my ASL masters. I had two directors of ASL who were these amazing women, um, Alexandria Wales and Ann Tomasetti. 
And Anne walked onto the set and was like, no deaf family is going to set up their furniture like this. Like you're never going to put the couch facing away from the door where you can't see who's coming in and out. Like it should be in a circle so everyone can see everyone else because even in order to like, you know, there's sort of a way that like hearing families set up their living room, like around the TV. And she's like, that's just not how we do it. And you don't want to be backlit by this window. And and so having all my, you know, my actors, Marley, Troy and Daniel and having Anne and Alexandria and having all of these deaf eyes on set who could kind of go, let's start moving around the furniture and like make this right. And I felt like that was every step of the way we were kind of having those moments. And my script really became like a blueprint, almost, you know, or, or well, not a blueprint, but like whatever, a, a plan to then like, once you started building the building, it was like, oh, let's throw this out. Let's, you know, let's get rid of this. And so it was sort of amazing, I think, to have it be this like fluid breathing thing that we were all participating in and that could evolve as I was getting educated as well through the process. Um, and Justin, it, you know, it, along those same lines, it, along those same lines, it's, you know, it's rare enough these days to see a film with a Korean American lead, rarer if not, in, never happened before to see a film with a Korean American lead with a Cajun accent. Um, can you just talk a little bit about bringing such a specific uh, character and culture to, to, to the screen? Yeah, you know, I had the same sort of considerations um, as Sean in the fact that, you know, there's not a lot of films about adoptees. Um, so I had to go through a, a, a kind of a similar process in terms of, of that whole world, you know, because um, you know, from the script to, you know, shooting and, and uh, also getting notes after and, and, and uh, making sure that uh, their experience was represented in a, in a way that was respectful. And, and I'm sure, Sean, you've, you've talked a lot about that as well, mm -hmm. as, as much as I have in terms of, of you know, uh, making a film about, you know, people or a person that, that, that you're, not, you're not a part of their experience. Um, in terms of the whole Cajun aspect of it, um, he, you know, being Asian American, I mean, I think things can be very novel, um, but we exist down there. Um, we exist all over the country. And um, it's about normalization. It's about, you know, taking something that might feel just peculiar and, and, and making it you know, very normal, very quickly. So, you know, my film, um, you know, the first scene is him and his daughter, who's also, you know, a step kid, who, his step kid, who's, who's white. And uh, here you see a, an Asian man with a white step kid with a, you know, Cajun accent. And, and uh, I don't cut away. It's just, you know, you're just gonna see the two of them and in interview and kind of mm -hmm. be forced to be dealt, you know, you, you have to deal with it. But, um, you know, it's, it's, I think, uh, you know, a lot of sort of bigotry or, or, or discrimination just, you know, or misconception just comes from exposure, you know, and, and the more you expose to something, the very, it quickly can become something that's, that's not even a big deal. So, you know, I think 10 minutes in, you don't even think about his accent anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I will say that, like, you know, some people complained and and a lot of people didn't think I should do it and they thought it was distracting at first, but but uh, I thought it was necessary because, um, you know, it's important to see all sorts of shades of, of, of our experience. And then um, the other thing is, is uh, you know, I picked uh, the South and specifically New Orleans because we rarely get to see two Asian American ethnicities in one film. We're usually allowed one. <laughs> uh, we never get to see uh, ourselves interact with one another on screen. Um, so, you know, for this film, it was a Vietnamese and the Korean community and how we can learn from each other and see similarities, but also differences. And uh, New Orleans, you know, has a huge enclave of Vietnamese Americans that were relocated there after the Vietnam War as refugees. Um, so uh, it was another huge reason I said it in uh, the South. That's really interesting. I, I want to jump in because I thought that character was so specific, Justin. And I think one of the things I found 
so refreshing. And like, I do think it's the key to representation is like being general is the enemy of representation. And like the incredible specificity of that character and everything about him and how he lived and, and like, and I felt that way too with Coda. It's like the moment you're trying to sort of create a general, you know, or you create a general character, it's like, the specificity is what makes it more universal because you understand that you're watching like one human being's journey and you're not telling the story of a Korean American, you're telling the story of this specific guy and his journey. And that's what's so humanizing about it. And, you know, I really felt that even within CODA, like, you know, Frank, the father, has a completely different experience than Jackie, his wife, in terms of their relationship with their daughter, in terms of their relationship with the community, in terms of, you know, Frank loves rap music because it vibrates his ass and Jackie doesn't give a shit about music. And, you know, like I just those details and that specificity, I think it is the key actually to real progress in terms of representing, you know, any group that is not seen on screen, because I think all harmful representation kind of starts with being general. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I agree. And I mean, watching Blue Bayou, I think one of the things with I, I and Justin, you're absolutely correct that after a few minutes, the accent is not something that you even really notice. But what it, afterwards, reflecting on it, I, it made me think that, oh, it, the way that it just represented how American that character was how like anybody else who grew, who grew up grew up and spent their life in that region they he sounds just like that and it, you know it made the 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 greater themes that the story was telling about you know him being sort of ripped out of his his regular life it, it hit that much harder because of how at home the character felt um in, in the beginning um i want to jump back a little bit and just um Justin, what first made you want to be a writer, a storyteller? How, how long have you been, um, you know, at this? Um, so I started acting in 2000, 2001. So it's been 20 years. Um, and that's part of the reason. <laughs> it's, um, you know, being an actor, you're just kind of like, uh, and especially ethnic actor, you're just very, you, you definitely, you know, there is a bamboo ceiling for me and, and, um, there was a particular in incident that I just was like, fuck this, I'm over it. I'm, I'm gonna do my, tell my own stories. Um, I was on set and of a, of a television show and they were having trouble blocking it. I just, I just was making a suggestion. I was just raising my hand. And I was like, hey, uh, what about if we did, and the guy just stopped me and, and, and he said, uh, what are you here? What are you paid to do here? And basically, uh, it was like act. He's like exactly. So shut the fuck up and do do what you're paid to do here. Yeah, and I was like, Jesus Christ, man, this guy, this guy, and he'd been around for a long time. I'm like, who was it, Justin? Who was it? I know, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, do it. You know, he couldn't even figure out the most basic thing. And I was like, why does this guy get to tell? Like, why does this guy have the keys? You know, and and I think that. Um, you know, along with uh, the, 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 the thing about representation and, and the specificity, um, I think I have a pers perspective that is very, um, perspective that is very specific. And, and I think that, um, I think it's important. You know, I think all of us, you know, if we're inclined to, should, should go out and tell stories. And I think um, the more different perspectives we have, you know the the more representation we, we you know that'll be out there but but i think um that's the reason you know and i, I you know being an actor there there is very i don't get to control the process so you know i can tell you the number of times i came, showed up to a film and i wasn't in it anymore or that's fine but like i was always kind of like oh well, i wonder why they made that choice but like it just you have no no sort of authorship um, and it's important. <laughs> and so once you, you know, once you made that decision for yourself, what were, what was like the, the first practical step you took? Was it, okay, I'm just gonna, 
I, did you already have ideas and half formed scripts? Did you have to really sit down and decide, you know, teach yourself how to be a writer? What was your process or tra for transitioning? Um, yeah, you know, I just, just out of, it was out of necessity, you know, for, for writing. Um, I, I, didn't read a lot growing up. I didn't. I didn't major in anything that had to do with writing at at, at school, and um, so it was just practicing. And and you know, I I have like so many short films that no one will ever see. And, <laughs> and, um, and uh, it's just a craft like any other, like like acting was, and and um, you know. Um, and it was the act of doing rather than, you know, theorizing or, or, or talking about it with friends. It was more about like sitting down in the chair and, and, and going through the entire process. Um, for me, you know, a, a writing is a means to directing. So, so it was about going through that whole process of writing it and then doing the whole pre-production and, and, and shooting and get the feedback loop um, and trial and error seeing what worked it didn't and then you know and then on the obvious like you know reading every single book and um every single youtube sort of uh you know talk <laughs> about you know structure and all that stuff but um writing for me is just is a blueprint uh like sean you know like he, it's also like um evolving it evolves you know it's not just about just what's on the page i, I go to set and and the, the script will evolve as I shoot as well, because you know, like the inputs we get, uh, it's very important to be to be um, receptive and open to um, what the story is telling me. It should be. <laughs> and Sean, what what about you? What was your way into becoming a storyteller yourself? I mean, I have a very similar journey actually to Justin. I mean, I started out as an actor, and I, you know. Looking back, I mean, my childhood birthday parties were like everyone would get like a character breakdown and a motivation and like a whole script. And this is when I was like nine, 10 and like people would have to show up in character and I would like direct the whole thing and, and I would get murdered at my own party and then come back and like solve my own murder. I mean, it was the most elaborate, insane thing. Um, so I think I was a direct, you know, I look back and I was like, well, clearly I, I needed to be bossing everyone around and in total control, but I, but I was an actor and I went to Carnegie Mellon for acting and then moved to New York and was doing theater and law and order and, you know, guest stars. And, um, and I think like Justin, I had an issue with honestly, like the storytelling a lot of the time. And I think I'd be on a set and be so much more interested, you know, as an actor, you go, you're supposed to go to your trailer when they're lighting. And I wanted to stay on set and be like, what's the gaffer do? Like, that's a gaffer. Okay. What's a gaffer? What's he doing? And I think I was just very interested in the process and, and also frustrated by what I felt like were the limitations, honestly, of being a woman who was playing guest stars and, you know, playing a rape victim three different times on TV and different shows, you know, and having a guy tell me, you know, I need you to rock and hold yourself and like be more sad. And you're like, you have no idea what I should be doing right now or not. Like, um, and so I started writing, like, I just really like writing was always an outlet for me. I think that was how I always journaled and kept, you know, just writing was, was my thing and my private thing. And then I think when I started to really explore, like, well, what are the stories I would be telling? And then, I, and then I started writing screenplays, but again, completely self-taught. I mean, I, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just kind of like, what is it to write a movie? Let me try. And, and I had a lot of actor friends and writer friends. And so I was always, you know, when I first moved to LA, there was a group called Tuesdays at nine that would gather at like St. Nick's pub and actors would show up and writers would bring in material and actors would cold read the material. So you could hear the writing out loud. And I started going to that as an actor. And then I was sort of like, well, why don't I bring my stuff in here and, and hear it out loud? And so I started doing that and, and, and then I ended up applying to AFI with a, actually a short film. Um, I was working as a nanny at the time and I was working at all of the, I mean, I had every odd job known to man, but I was bartending and babysitting for all the four star hotels in LA. So I was like a nanny who would show up and work at the Four Seasons or the Bel Air. And I had a very weird experience with this woman one night and I ended up writing it as like a short film and brought it into that group and read it, you know, heard it read aloud. And I was like, oh, I wanna make this film. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so I applied to AFI with that short um, and got in and, and made that short through AFI. And then that film, which was a short, my first short film went to Cannes and was in competition and like started this whole journey kind of where I was like, oh, well, I guess this door is opening and let me go through it. Um, and it was so much more fulfilling. I mean, I, I didn't want to hang on to being an actor. I feel like once I discovered directing, I was like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. It didn't feel like, oh, now I want to, you know, mm -hmm. continue to act in, in my stuff. I think just that's not, I don't know. I don't know if I was ever even that amazing as an actor to, to continue doing that, but I, it also just didn't fulfill me in the way that, that directing did. And so, um, yeah, that was my path. And again, like also writing to direct, like I felt like I wrote my film because I knew that the only way I was going to get a chance to direct it is if I kind of had the script as, you know, collateral to, to be like, well, you, if you want to make this movie, I'm going to be the one to do it. And then, you know, after I made mother and it, it took me nine years to get my first feature made. And then in that time I was writing for television. So I sort of developed this whole separate career as a, TV writer, like while I was kind of trying to get my first feature to Lula made um, and wrote on Orange is the New Black for three seasons. And so I had these kind of amazing experiences that A, gave me like a crash course in filmmaking because I felt like I was shadowing every director who came to work on my episodes and I was just absorbing it all. And so when I finally did make my first feature, I didn't feel like a first time filmmaker. I felt like I had all this production experience under my belt. And so those, you know, those two things were really playing off each other. Your experience writing for television, obviously it's, you're starting a, a, a different master and it's a very different beast. I'm curious, beyond just the production experience, was there anything, what were some of the things you learned as a, you know, working on Orange is the New Black that kind of bleeds into your work as a writer director? I mean, so many things. I think the biggest thing I learned for, from writing for TV is that there's always a better idea. Like the, you know, like the idea that I think oftentimes filmmakers when they're starting or younger writers are like very precious about like, oh, I wrote this scene and, and, and you get a big note like about something that's not working in your script, but you're afraid like to dismantle too much because what if all this other stuff falls apart and I want to hold on to that scene or that great line or that character. And it's like, I think the biggest thing I took from writing for, you know, TV is that you'd go off and write something brilliant and you'd bring it back in the writer's room and the showrunner would go, you know what, we're not going to do that. We're going to do that. And you were like, what the, like, this was so good. Like I crafted this amazing thing. And like, this was the idea. And then you talk for, you know, a day and a half and there's a better idea. And it's like, oh, well that's even better. And, and it, and so in a way, I think it gave me like a, just a freedom with like throwing shit out and being like, you know what, we'll find something better. Or I'll find something better. Or like, yeah, you know, start the movie halfway through and, and it's in a way come into editorial as well, where it's like, you know, I think I'm not beholden to what was there before, because I feel like you can play and you can find more story other places. And, and there's like a, fluidity to it that I think is really important. Um, and also just like watching so many different kinds of people work. You know, I think that was the thing um, in television is like, you're watching a different director come in every time. And you also start to realize like, there's so many different approaches that work. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the directors that are like only focused on the camera and shot design and whatever. And in a way, like, you know, that's where their head is. And then you see the people that are really actors, directors, and they're sort of letting the DP block the whole scene and, and, you know, and it can all kind of work. And so I think that was the other thing was that this idea that there was a certain person I had to be as a director, I could let go of that and go like, I can find who I am as a director and it can be organic to me and great. And it doesn't have to emulate anybody else. It can just be my own style. Um, Justin, I saw you nodding your head in agreement earlier when Sean was talking about the, the fact that, you know, there's always a better idea out there. I'm curious, is that something that you found in your process as well? Um, I've, I, you know, I've never been in a writer's room and, and I, I'd love to just to, just to get that experience of, of also if you're having a hard time, like you have 
so many other people to, to kind of like bounce ideas off and everything. But like, uh, because of, <laughs> I've done everything sort of solo, um, I find that there's probably a better idea in the edit because I'm like, <laughs> you know, there's probably a better idea that, that, that could, or, or the other thing is, you know, like I'm not precious. So, you know, um, you know, editing is basically rewriting, but I'm so quick to just throw, throw, th oh, that doesn't work. That, that absolutely does not work. Um, all the time, but um, I, I'm definitely, uh, I try not to be precious as well, you know, uh, when I, uh, usually after I, I have a, a draft I, I want to take out and I have people read it, you know, if, if a few people say the same thing that, oh, I didn't get that or, or oh, that, that, that feels, you know, unnecessary, um, you know, there's usually probably a better way in or, or a different way or, or, or it's just not necessary. Mm -hmm. um, but I absolutely agree with that. <laughs> um, I want to just kind of, you know, we're talking about writing and directing. Justin, how did, let's using sort of Blue Bayou as an example, how did this start for you? So what was the first inkling you had and then, you know, of the idea of the story? And then what was the journey from that inkling to actually starting to put, you know, pen to paper, so to speak. Yeah. Um, you know, again, I, I started hearing through the adoptee community that, that this issue was, was around and, and then, um, and it was shocking. And then I did some research and I read articles and, and, you know, um, and did, uh, my own sort of, um, research with, with, you know, watching videos and, and talking to people. And, and the biggest thing I found was when I asked other people who weren't in the community, if they had any idea this was happening, nobody knew adoptees were being deported. And, you know, mind you, this isn't just, you know, Korean adoptees. This is people from Central America, South America, Russia, you know, India, China, anywhere that, that people are brought here from. Um, and, um, you know, and then I, I had this idea to, to tell this story and then uh, I had to go pitch it because it wasn't, it didn't feel like a story I could uh, you know, my first two films were micro budgets and, 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 uh, but this just, I don't, didn't think I could accomplish it with, with that kind of a budget. So I had to go pitch it. Um, so I pitched it to a few places, but macro, um, you know, being, a you know, an African American company. And, and at that time, all the, um, the executives were women. And I just felt like, oh, this, this, this place feels like the, the company that's going to understand me as a filmmaker. And, and you know, give me the the latitude to, to do what I need to do, and um, yeah. So then it was you know about writing it, and then going through drafts, and and um, and then um, you know doing the proper research. You know, um, every draft of my film, um, I'm sure like like Sean's, I had to you know have adoptees read it. You know, every single draft was read, and and their input was was felt in the film, and. And I had to make sure that uh, their voices were included and, and heard. And then once I got to a certain stage, uh, I had uh, people who were impacted adoptees that were either facing deportation or or uh, had already been deported to read the script. And their notes were also incorporated in the film. And and um, yeah, that was just sort of the the journey from inception to the screen, you know. And then once you once you you know um, are going to go shoot it, you have to do some rewrites depending on you know, limitations with, with, you know, again, this is a independent film. So there's certain limitations that you have and you have to make some adjustments. So mm -hmm. some rewriting needs to be done at that point as well. And Sean, what about you? What was the, you know, sort of first inkling you had about this story? And then, you know, what, what was the journey from that to actually, you know, having a script that, uh, that you're ready to shoot? Well, so this started out as a studio movie. It was um, at Lionsgate and it was a remake of a French film called La Famille Bellier. And this was, I had been at Sundance with my first film Tallulah and it was after that. And I was kind of looking for like what I was gonna jump into next. And the idea of a remake at first felt strange to me because I'm kind of always suspicious of like why movies are being remade, you know, particularly foreign films because you're like, is it just that you want it in English with less subtitles, you know? And, and so I, when I watched the original, 
I was sort of like really coming in with an open mind of like, what is the story here? And is there potential to kind of take this story and make it my own? And I felt like there was so much potential in that character and in that story and family that was really kind of unfulfilled by the first movie. So then there was this feeling of like, oh, here's this amazing character, you know, the idea of a coda who grows up within deaf culture, who is, you know, ASL is their first language, they feel most comfortable in deaf culture, and yet they're a hearing person. And so they have to be the bridge between those two worlds. And also, oftentimes, they're not comfortable in the hearing world. And yet that's supposed to be sort of the community that they're identified with. And so that tension, which I felt like could create be such a deep exploration. Um, and then the fact that like, ASL wasn't really utilized that much in the original film. I mean, they, there was no, you know, the parents were played by hearing people who had learned to sign for their roles. And so in a way it couldn't be authentic in, in how it should be. And so there was just all this potential. It was like, oh, this is a great story, you know, and this is a very tense present, you know, premise about familial, you know, tensions and, and dysfunction in a way. And, and, yet I felt like I could totally find my own movie within it. So I started researching and I, I was, you know, it was kind of, at first it was like this awkward thing of like, well, I don't want to be this, the person to tell this story unless I feel like I can do it right. And so, you know, I had to go make deaf friends and start going to deaf West theater and immersing myself that and in that and learning ASL so that I have could have an understanding of the language. And I knew eventually, you know, half of my script was in ASL. So it was, it was going to be a journey to kind of direct for a language that was not my own. And, and so all of that. And I think, um, and then in the process, the studio was not trying to make the same movie I was trying to make. It's like, once I got invested in kind of deaf culture and what I wanted to do, there was a lot of pushback in terms of like, oh, you're going to cast all deaf actors. Like, could you cast one deaf actor maybe, and then have, you know, Jeez. Brad Pitt learn to sign. Not that that came up, but I mean, literally it felt like that. And I was like, no, I'm not interested in making this movie unless we can have deaf actors playing these roles. And, and then it was kind of like, well, okay, then, you know, we'll, then the girl, you know, then Ruby needs to be Taylor Swift, you know, Ruby needs to be a pop star or somebody that's going to get the movie financed. And I wasn't interested in that either, not nothing against Taylor Swift, but I felt like this person needed to become this character and, and, you know, sign like a fluent signer and, you know, sing incredibly well, but go out on fishing boats and learn how to look like she's been doing that her whole life. And, so it really became this thing where it was like stuck at the studio for a really long time. And it seemed like they just kept trying to put together the jigsaw puzzle of like, how was this movie financeable? And eventually Patrick Washburger left Lionsgate and he took the movie with him. Um, but in a way I was ready to see the movie die there because I didn't, there was the, I didn't feel like it should exist unless it was made a certain way. And and so it kind of was really sad, but it was like, if this is the version of the movie they want to make, like, I don't want to make that movie. So like, it's okay. I worked so hard on the script. I love it, but I know the movie it needs to be. And then we took it out of the studio and got, you know, independent financing and made it for half the price that the studio was trying to make it for. And, you know, had this like indie run and gun production but I got to make exactly the movie that I wanted to make. And so it was the perfect journey because all of those fights that I was having, you know, no, I don't want to have Ruby talking through every scene to make a hearing audience comfortable. She would never be speaking aloud to her family. It doesn't make any sense. Like, <laughs> yes, I want to subtitle the scene. No, I don't want to fill those ASL scenes with music. I want them to be silent. I don't want score through the whole movie. Like all these things that I felt like, were so important to me. And like, because of the way we made it, I got to fight for those things. And I think that's the strength of the movie and the other version would have been terrible to me. So 
<laughs> when you're on the other side of it, it all feels so inevitable and like perfect. You know, you're like, oh, of course the movie took this many years to make because we needed to get to this place where I could have the cast I wanted and I could, you know, do what I wanted. But when you're in the middle of it, it feels like heartbreaking and you're being asked to compromise so much, you know, to get your movie made that there's always that point where you're like, is this still the movie that I want to make if I make these compromises? And for me, it wasn't. So it was, it was a great journey. And, you know, and then that sale at Sundance felt so satisfying because it was like, guess what guys, it was a good investment and it was a commercial movie. And like, you know, you missed out, but like, it, it felt like it had to take this kind of long ride. Um, I, you know, you you mentioned something earlier about you know uh, writing to direct, um, and I'm curious, are you you know from the start of your process, are you already thinking as a director while you're writing, or is there a separation there at any point? What you know, how does that work for you, Sean? I mean, I I I'm so much thinking as a director that I don't even write stage directions sometimes, and I remember when I was writing for TV you know, the first episode of Orange is the New Black I wrote that Jodie Foster was directing. And I remember like my action lines were like so limited. Like it was sort of, you know, bare minimum, you're at so-and-so's house and there's a couple of things because I can see the room in my mind. And yet I realized like, oh, if I'm handing this off to another director, I need to be super explicit about what that space looks like, you know, what the, if some writers like go to town on their action lines, I'm like very minimal with that so that I can just get to the characters in the dialogue. So I think I almost had to train myself to write for another director, to be able to look at my script and get all that character information and all that kind of world information to be able to talk to a production designer and know what that space should be looking like. And, you know, the details of that, so, you know, but I do think from when I'm directing my own stuff, you know, you have your, your writer hat on and you're so in it. And then as a director, it's almost like you then get on set and you're like, who's this fucking writer that wrote this shit? Like this sucks, <laughs> you know, like throw that out and let's, let's do this instead. And so I think there's a lot of you know, what works on the page or what works in your head when you're alone in a room on your laptop. Sometimes you get into the scene and, you know, it comes out of the actor's mouth and you go like, uh, -uh this doesn't work. And, and so I think there's a lot of, I probably overwrite as a writer. I think I, you know, I cut 35 scenes from Coda in the wow. edit. Um, and I think it was just overwritten. It's like, you know, every character's backstory was like in there somehow. And I think then I got into the edit and it was like, oh, I don't actually need to like meet Mr. V's family. And I don't actually need to have all these scenes with the fishermen to know what's going on. But in a way, all of that extra writing builds out the world and makes the characters feel like they're living lives beyond what you're seeing on screen. So in a way, I think it really does inform what you're seeing in the movie. Um, mm. but definitely I think, you know, I'm probably more minimal as a director than I am as a writer. Justin, what about you? What's the relationship between the writer and the director? Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of my first opportunity to direct, you mm. know, um, uh, is the writing of it, you know, you kind of get to visualize and, 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 and write, um, what you think the version of the movie, the perfect version of the movie first. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I have some similarities to Sean in, in the fact that I, I overwrite as well. Um, but that's kind of, you know, because I'm directing, you know, it's, I have that luxury to, to overwrite things and, and, um, and I'm already planning, you know, what I'm going to be doing on set in terms of, uh, you know, say it's an emotional scene and, and, and one trick that I found that can help is, is you know, you, have, you can have a version of the scene that's very, all the subtext is kind of written out for the characters and, and I, can, I can have them, um, you know, rehearse that version and we can, we can even maybe shoot it and, and, and uh, 
you know, because they're saying all that stuff out loud, you know, it it's, can kind of help. It depends on who the actor is, but it can kind of help get them emotionally prepped. And then, you know, and then you just start to strip it away. You start to say, you know, we don't need this line. We don't need this line. And you just cut it uh, to the bare minimum sometimes. And then all those emotions are still present. But, you know, that, that tends to work a lot of times with, uh, you know, I work with a lot of non-actors and, and real people and that kind of helps with 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 uh, those those performers but um yeah writing is is the first chance to direct is 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 my feeling and for you you had the added uh, complication challenge i don't know what you want to call it of being in front of the camera as well um you've written your you've written the words you're going to say you're directing your own performance or is it all blend together into you know one role or you know is the actor you you know relating to director you or thinking about the writer who wrote this script like how how, how does that work when you're there on set well the well, the acting aspect of it is you know when you're on set you you just gotta let it go you know i can't be thinking about my acting while you know um but the big thing is uh, is rehearsals for me, you know, I have to, if I'm going to be in it, you know, I have to rehearse it, uh, so that, you know, when we're on set with the other actors, I'm not worrying about my performance. I, um, I'm absolutely focused on, on their needs. Um, I need, th- I need them to feel confident in, in, in where we're going in my direction and not have them think that I'm thinking about myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's separate. You know, it's separate. Uh, once once you're on set, like I'm not. You know, yeah. My main goal on set, uh, if I'm in the scene, is is to make sure that they're serviced and that they their questions are met and that they feel comfortable and confident that in what they're doing. Uh, I come very last, so it's it, it's kind of a catch twenty two because, uh, for at least for Blue Bayou, I you know my needs are completely like they they even forget like my ad and everybody kind of forgets that i'm even in the film and they don't consider like that i might need a second or they're just like (laughs) it's it's kind of like i'm an afterthought but um but that's okay that's what i signed up for um but uh it's a particular skill you know um it's a particular skill and and i think that uh I, I'd like to think that, uh, you know, those decades of acting class, you know, probably helped because, you know, being in class, kind of have to direct yourself mm-hmm. and then, you know, and then you present it to the teacher or whatever. But, but, um, but yeah. You, uh, Justin, you, you guys have both talked about how the, the sort of the last part of, of this process is, is editing and that you're, you're basically, that's another chance to direct or to, to write it again. Um, can you talk about on Blue Bayou um, what the post production was like, and you know, did, did the the film massively change from what the script was? Where there's like new material, or what was that like for you? Well, yeah, I mean, like what Sean was saying, you know, I found out that I had a ton of extra shit I didn't need, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, when you're writing it, you're like, no, 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 this 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 scene is very important, and. And then you're constantly trying to battle with the producers like that are trying to pare things down because they want a shootable script that, that that's within budget, you know. Um, but but I always think overshooting is great because, you know, like it's also great for the characters to, to kind of experience, you know, more of a world. But but uh, in the edit, you know, I find that a lot of times there's a lot of things that, that aren't necessary and, and that you're paring down and, you know, sometimes that 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 adage of less is more is true and um but yeah and and again it, it, you know uh not being too precious as Sean's saying like you know you know Sean you might be feeling that in the writer's room and and also in the edit sometimes like you know I'm like y- when I get the same note a few times from screening the film that like oh I didn't feel I felt like this was a double beat or or, or this is extraneous, or, or I didn't get this. Like, uh, just being open and, and not being too precious with anything and just be willing to... Um, but I would say the, the script uh, is pretty intact, what's on screen. It's just paring it down and, and, and what's absolutely necessary to, to make it more potent is it felt like was the process for at least Blue Bayou. 
and Sean. So th 35 scenes you said were, so I, how long was the original script? How many pages? Do you remember offhand? It wasn't that long. I think it was like, I mean, it was, I think I'm going to say it was under a hundred pages. I mean, it wasn't, it so wasn't. So where do you find 35 scenes to cut from? <laughs> um, well, it's interesting. I mean, I, I was probably way more precious in editorial on my first feature than I was, you know, moving forward. I mean, I, oh my God, look at that cute. cute. Child. <laughs> um, I, uh, I mean, I, I had an experience actually, I, I run a show called Little America. And right before I made Coda, I had shot an episode of that show that I wrote, directed, and I was the showrunner. So like nobody was telling me no. It was kind of that crazy thing that you never get in TV where you're sort of just like, okay, this episode is like completely mine. And I had my director edit and then I had my producer edit. Like normally in TV, the director goes in and does their cut and then the producer comes in and recuts the director's cut. In, the, in that case, I was both. So I did my director's cut. I like walked, literally like walked out of the room, like out in the hallway, got a cup of coffee and like came back in as the producer to recut my own cut. And I threw the whole thing out. Like I came back in and it was almost like, literally I was a different character. And I was like, this director's insane. Like, let's get rid of like half these scenes. Let's like, I mean, I cut all the dialogue from the first, you know, half of the episode. I was like, there was all this dialogue. I was like, no, let's make this episode completely silent. Like I came in with a completely different thing. And in a way, my experience on that episode where I was like, oh, I could make a crazy decision in the edit like this episode is going to be silent. And I didn't care that, you know, I begged my friend Zach Quinto to come be on the show and he had all these lines. <laughs> and then I just like cut every one of his lines, you know, in the episode, it was sort of like very freeing. And in a way, because I was like playing these two different characters. And I think I brought that vibe into the edit on Coda where I knew the story I'd written and then it was like, forget that, like, forget everything you guys shot, forget, forget the fact that like that those days out to sea were so hard. Cause that's one of the things I find as a director in the edit is you're like, how can I cut that scene? Like we had seven fishing boats, you know, seven boats, three miles out to sea, like, or that shot that you had the crane for that was so amazing. And you're like, I can't cut that. And then in a way, if I put on that character of like, you know, the, the insane, I don't give a shit showrunner <laughs> who's then coming in, it's like, you go, I don't really care what happened in production. You don't need that crane shot or you don't need that entire scene that yes, had maybe 300 extras in it. And, and so it was just cool. And I, my editor was amazing for me in that, like I, Jero Brisson was, was my editor and I had worked with him on Little America and he and I just kept going like, what's the story? What's the story? It, if it's not about the family and it's not about Ruby, then it can go like, you know, and I felt so bad, you know, some of my actors like uh, Ferdia who played Miles you know, I cut so many of his scenes from the movie because there was this whole love story in the script that was really fleshed out. And I was like, I'm not telling a love story. The love story is between Ruby and her family. And mm -hmm. so you get in the edit and you're like, okay, you know, throw all that out. And, it, and you know, it, it's so important. At the same time, the edit was interesting because there's a lot of, um, when you're cutting 35 scenes, normally you would take a piece of information from that scene that was really important and maybe like throw it in as a line of ADR into another scene or, you know, have an actor on the back of their head and you throw in a couple lines you really need. Because I was shooting ASL and half the movie was in ASL, everything was on camera. So you couldn't like, grab a line from another scene or grab kind of something and get information in because every single thing was on camera. So it was dictating my cutting rhythm in the edit where you can't cut away from someone while they're talking, which normally, I mean, the first scene or one of the first scenes of maybe it is the first scene of your movie, Justin, where you're just on you, 
you know, and you just hear the interviewer the whole time off camera, you never even see him. I love that stuff as a filmmaker. I think it's so subjective and interesting, but I really, because I was shooting ASL and it's a totally visual language, there's no way to have a line off camera. So you're, you're, it's dictating your rhythms in the edit. And that was a really interesting thing for me when you're cutting 35 scenes, how do you maintain like the logic of your story and the rhythms of your story without being able to take any of those lines or emotions or information and get them in somewhere else? Yeah. That sounds like a, like a complicated math problem. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> last question before we wrap up here, cause we're nearing the end of our time. Um, Justin, uh, what is, you know, having gone through this process with Blue Bayou now, um, what would your advice be to, uh, you know, someone who is looking to write and direct themselves? What do you think, uh, you know, would be a good thing to, to tell them? I think, you know, like what Sean is saying, you know, when you try to do something in the system, um, you know, there's a certain, <laughs> you know, it's, it's the reason why I, I, I've kind of stayed out of the system. Um, the, my entire career is, is a writer director, but, but, um, is don't give a shit what what anybody else you know thinks it should be you know if it's going to be something that, that you're planning to helm all the way through dude you, you're going to have to live with this this thing you're making for so many years that why would you you know kind of dilute it in any which way it should be exactly what gets you excited what is is important to you and and what you think it should be that would be my biggest advice is 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 you know if it's got to be exciting for you you know because that's that's what's going to to push you through all the way till the end especially if you're directing because you're going to have to live with this for so long and and to think about what someone else thinks it should be or 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 uh, what you think will sell or what do you think is going to make them happy dude that's just a recipe for disaster and 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 you you know if you do what you want you'll never regret it if you do what is your north star or or say it's like you know from for my film it was very important that it was about an adoptee and and that's going through deportation a very specific thing you know, and if it's about keeping that integral, you know, um, and and not letting any anyone talk you out of the things that make that important, um, you how are you going to regret that? You 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 know that that's always the right choice. So that would be my my main advice. That's that's awesome, Sean. What about you? What would you if the the writer directors or aspiring writer directors who are watching this? What would you say to them? I mean, I echo what Justin said. Like it's just as hard to make a bad movie as a good movie. Like you, you have to do the same amount of work. Like you're going to have the same hours on set. You're going to have the same amount of time in the edit, like, you know, and it has to be something you really care about. And I don't mean that it has to be like important in the sense that it's like an issue. Like it could be a comedy. It could be it, like, it has to make you laugh. You have to love the thing that you're making and feel that the story has to exist because nobody is going to fight for your movie the way that you are. Um, and I would say, this is piggybacking off, you know, yes, I would say, don't listen to the forces at work that are saying like, if you cast this actor, you get your movie made and you've got that bad feeling in your gut. You know, there's a difference between going like, oh, that's an interesting thing. Like, yeah, that person, could, could get me the money, but also that could be really interesting. That's a different feeling than just that like bad feeling in your gut that you're sacrificing something major about your movie um, that I think you really have to listen to and trust your gut as a filmmaker. At the same time, do listen to people that are better writers than you, you know? And I think do that thing really resonated for me that Justin said, like when you hear it more than once about your script, or if multiple people are bumping on the same thing or coming into your edit to watch a rough cut and going, I don't really, that scene doesn't do it for me. Like you're, you're making something for an audience. So the idea that it should only be for you is also kind of a mistake. Sometimes I think it has to be for you. And like, 
I believe in this. I believe why I'm telling it, but also there is a lot to be said for like fresh eyes on material. And I think it's like that thing, like if, if one person honks at you, they're the asshole, but if multiple people honk at you, you're the asshole. It's like, if you're hearing the same note over and over again about your script, like there's probably something there. And maybe the note that, you know, and I think this is true about like executive notes too, sometimes on TV, you know, sometimes they're not giving you the right fix, but they're, but they're pointing to a problem and they might not have the right answer, but they're pointing at something that needs to be excavated and examined. So I think it's important sometimes to pay attention to those things and not go, you know, well, it's my movie and I don't care that like six people have said the same thing about my script. I think it's worth looking at your script again and, um, you know, and not being afraid to pull the one thread that unra unravels the whole sweater. Like, I think that that's the thing that people are afraid of is like, oh, if I do this one thing, it's all going to fall apart. And it's like, you can rebuild the script. You can find a different way in and, and not be afraid of the process being kind of messy along the way. Well, I think that's really awesome advice to leave everybody with. Justin and Sean, thank you guys so much for taking the time today. To everybody watching, um, I'm Phil Galasso from Final Draft. On behalf of the Writers Guild Foundation, I want to say thanks. And if you haven't, check out Blue Bayou and Coda. Both are very much worth your time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. thanks guys. Thank you, guys.